So very good afternoon and uh, hello to my fellow panelists. I am pleased to welcome you all to another invigorating session at the Tech and Innovation Summit 2021. COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of technology, especially in the healthcare sector with the rise of health tech. Today's discussion will be a fascinating deep dive into health tech and the accessible roadmap to tomorrow's potential and will leave you with some inspiring ideas. We're joined by experts who will be sharing their perspectives on what the future of health tech holds and shining a light on critical issues such as using health tech to make healthcare cheaper, the intersection of data and healthcare, and bringing all stakeholders, including doctors and patients together. Allow me to introduce you to our distinguished panelists. I welcome on stage Sandeep Senkal, co-founder and MD, Nexus Venture Partners, Suresh Venkataria, CEO of Wak Technologies, and Harsh Simirbir Singh, co-founder, Pristine Care. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today at this session. Thanks, Punita. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Thanks, thanks, Punita, for having us here. Thanks. So I'll uh, start into the discussion mode right away. And uh, Sandeep, you being an investor, I'll first come to you to understand uh, from you because you as an entrepreneur started a healthcare company. And then now you are also, you've also invested in a lot of healthcare ventures, including Liberate, Crelio Health. So what kind of involvement do you have you seen of this sector? And especially during the time of pandemic, wherein we have seen this sector really emerging out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the key thing, as you mentioned, is emerging out. Uh, and it's a, it's a broader trend, obviously, in the industry with uh, digital uh, business models scaling up much faster and health is no exception. I think the biggest change that we saw was a flip on the consumer's you know, purchasing behavior. So uh, before the pandemic, I would say, uh, if you looked at digital models and digital health in particular, the uh, ability to pay or the desire to pay was a big question mark. And uh, in, during this pandemic, it sort of digital health became the only way that one could consume health. You know, there were it was hard to go to a hospital. People didn't want to go to a hospital, but you still had health issues that you had to take care of. And so, now if you were trying to reach a doctor, you know, and doing a phone call or uh, you know WhatsApp, it was, you know, it was tough to just assume that they would not get paid. And so, the big flip that has happened, in my view, is uh, the consumer's uh, openness to paying for digital health is having a big impact. And that will uh, that is leading to models across the board, right? So you have your D2C models where health uh, providers are going direct to consumers and are building platforms or solutions in either verticals or, or, or more broadly. There is uh, There are solutions emerging for taking existing providers uh, who are offline into an omni-channel platform where you are, you know, a patient can consult with a doctor either on their phone or in the hospital, or actually all the way to, you know, as with Pristine, actually doing procedures, uh, you know, but they start off with a D2C model. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third uh, big area that continues to uh, sort of see investments is uh, this cross-border tech, right? The, the cross-border health opportunities where Indian companies are building products in India but potentially can look to take it global. So uh, it's a it's a very exciting time uh, in the healthcare space. We have seen a lot of uh, emergence of different models. The one other thing I would sort of leave behind, not, not from a Nexus perspective, but I have been very actively involved in this ACT initiative where we are bringing private innovation into public uh, healthcare service, right? So public health uh, it remains a very large portion of healthcare delivery in India. Right. And we are also seeing a lot of, there's an emergence of uh, a joint model, this pa private partnership model, where the governments are much more open to working with private healthcare providers, which I think is a very good sign because it will allow our private companies to scale much faster. So whether it is tele-ICUs, whether it is testing uh, solutions, whether it is... Uh, you know, in, and this is a lot of this has happened in the COVID context, right? But uh, I would say those are now becoming a lot uh, broader. And I, I, it just, I think, is another um, factor in, in driving uh, growth 
in healthcare companies. So I would like to leave it at that and you know, come back later. Okay, sure. So Harsh, coming to you, uh, what kind of impact, I mean, uh, it had uh, on uh, pristine care because of the pandemic, I mean, uh, did you see uh, more users being lined up? And when we talk about digital healthcare, what was the emergence like? You know, so uh, I, I think Sandeep indicated towards what we do, uh, you know, Christine is uh, specializing in actually doing surgeries or procedures, which actually happen uh, largely inside an OT. So there is at the end of the entire journey, there's a, you know, a person inside OT with a doctor and entire team. So it's a very physical uh, culmination of the entire process. Uh, but but during the uh, pandemic, you know, when Narendra Modi, our prime minister, came on national television and, you know, very rightfully announced that, you know, because healthcare infrastructure is under pressure, that elective surgeries should be slightly discouraged. So I think at that point of time, uh, you know, of course, there was an impact on our business. But then, uh, you know, in healthcare, everything cannot be postponed. So while uh, elective or non-emergency procedures were postponed, there was a lot of emergency or semi-emergency procedures or patient care, which was not, uh, you know, which was not possible to be postponed. I think at that point of time, uh, taking a pick from what Sandeep said, there was a huge change in mindset of not just the patients. In fact, you know, I, uh, you know, in, in our experience, I think the biggest impact actually has been in terms of the doctors, the mindset of a doctor, because, you know, uh, just like every other consumer internet company, we are technology first, uh, we expect our doctors to use EMRs, our doctor apps and every other technology as a clinical pathway. And I think the adoption and the uh, enthusiasm towards, you know, just using that technology went to a different angle. And I think that for us has a huge, huge impact. So when pandemic happened, we realized that a lot of our hospitals got COVID covered. A lot of our, you know, clinics got shut down. We operate like 100 clinics across our 30 cities. So we had to come and innovate and find ways and secure our, you know, sort of secure our business. So we, just like every other uh, healthcare startup, we developed, uh, you know, tele, telehealth uh, or teleconversation where a doctor and a patient could interact via video or in online, even before the day of the surgery. We reduced the patient's visits, uh, you know, to our clinics while we had to shut down our clinics. Uh, you know, the online conversation started to happen. We started segmenting hospitals. So there were a lot of hospitals who were covered with COVID. We started segmenting hospitals where there were no COVID patients. And we ended up actually, you know, almost investing in them to increase the safety procedures from thermometers, clinical masks, respirators, every other, every other, you know, sanitizations, every other processes you can think of. We started, you know, solving for patient travel because there was so much fear and lack of, you know, you know, the mobility got impacted hugely. We started picking up patients from home. We started, uh, you know, doing their advanced paperwork. So, you know, if, you know, if you've ever experienced a hospital, you have to go to the hospital and there's so much paperwork before you can yeah. get admitted. We started doing all of it remotely that even before a patient lands up, how does that paperwork gets done um, and stuff like that. We had to go and, uh, you know, enable our doctors uh, with all the protection mechanisms, you know, masks, PPC, so that they are, uh, you know, they are protected. We also had to develop a lot of, you know, our diagnostic networks uh, because, you know, because of the natural risk of a doctor and patient interacting in such a closed loop, there was a risk of transmission. So we had to really test all our patients for COVID. So we, you know, went down and developed our COVID testing uh, ecosystem. Uh, we partnered with some of the players. We developed our own ecosystem to a larger extent where every patient was, you know, tested for RT-PCR or antigen in certain scenarios where RT-PCR was not possible so that we can ensure protection. So stuff like that. But I think uh, largely... Uh, you know, COVID has brought, COVID or this pandemic has brought about, a, you know, uh, the, the acceptance of technology in health far more, I think, which would have been done in the last 10 years. Like from the doctors to hospitals, uh, Sandeep indicated the patients to, you know, uh, the government. Uh, you know, we remember we remember when the government passed those telehealth guidelines. I think it took 13 years to come at first stage and then it took probably probably, you know, less than a week to arrive at stage two. So yes. I, I think regulators also helped drastically. So the acceptance of technology in uh, during COVID, I think, went to a very large degree, which was, I think, the biggest change for us. Sure. Suresh, coming to you, uh, you have an interesting uh, model, that too, in the dialysis space. So what was the impact of the pandemic? I mean, you want to share your side of it? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, if you consider our space, especially those patients who are having kidney disease, uh, there are two uh, different aspects. One is those patients, they have a kind of a kidney disease. They call the pre-kidney failure patients and those who are having kidney failures. I mean, those patients, those go through transplantations or for that matter, dialysis. So when you consider about a dialysis, uh, probably as you guys may be aware, there are about 90% of the patient, they go through in-center dialysis. It means they have to go to a center, then they have to get the dialysis done every other day. And the world where we talked about uh, social distancing and then staying away from the crowd and not traveling in public places. But for these patients, it was not the case. 90% of those patients have to go there. If they miss a week, then they will die. So, uh, and then these patients are extremely vulnerable. Means uh, those patients who are having kidney disease, they also have a heart disease, sometimes liver, diabetes. So there are a lot of things happen. In fact, starting from Wuhan, when the issue happened, there are a lot of patients got infected who are having kidney and dialysis uh, patient. And right now in Singapore, there is one of the biggest cluster is on the dialysis clinic. So for us, uh, since we are developing a product uh, that is kind of a next generation, a wearable product where patients can get the therapy on the go and predominantly at home. Uh, there are a lot of uh, interest from the investment community, clinicians, as well as uh, when we're trying to uh, go to the next level. Uh, there is a lot of lot of momentum on the home care side of it. And even from the payers' perspective, and when you consider in US, uh, I mean, India, I'm not so uh, into dialysis market yet, but we are just trying to do something there. Uh, but in the U.S., they spend about 7% of their healthcare budget on kidney failure patients. 7% of uh, CMS budget goes there. And then 90% of the spend happens in center. So they're trying to change the I mean, the paradigm. They're planning to shift most of the patient to home. And there is a huge shift, shift towards that. And we strongly believe the same thing eventually will happen in Asia. In, in Hong Kong, it's 80% home dialysis. In India, for that matter, maybe it's more than 95% of the patients, they go to in-center, get a dialysis done. Uh, and probably uh, more than 500,000, maybe close to a million patients, they just die because they cannot afford. So there are twin problems here. One is they cannot get uh, proper therapy at center. Second one is probably they don't even have access, in fact. So, yeah. yeah. Sure. So Sandeep, uh, coming to you again, I mean, we spoke about uh, new segments in digital healthcare and telemedicine coming up. So are there any new areas further which you want to talk about wherein you see these are the green shoots emerging uh, and these will be targeted by venture capitalists for investment? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting what uh, Suresh mentioned in terms of uh, kidney care. We invested in a company, we actually were one of the seed investors in the company called Cricket Health in the US uh, yeah. and uh, I, I see Suresh smiling. I think, you know, th that those are the kind of models that are emerging. Basically, uh, dialysis is a, is a large requirement and it's, it's growing. There are uh, limitations in existing models uh, that Suresh has highlighted some of those. And I think that's where changes will happen. So you will see new models emerge uh, in India and across, across the board. So uh, as I mentioned, there are, two large, I would say, clusters of innovation we see. One is in the area, which is the normal place where money has gone in healthcare, which is the metro sort of sec A population targeted uh, situations, right? So elective surgery actually sort of falls in that bucket, uh, yeah. right? Um, and then you have a series of investments that will happen that are more mass in nature where it will be really driven by volume rather than price. So there is a, so you can look at it that there are two types of, uh, you know, in healthcare, either you make money by, you charge a lot, but it's, it's innovation it's driven by innovation and you can charge more because that population is less price sensitive, but needs that healthcare, right? So oncology is a segment where effectively, you know, drugs are at lakhs of rupees, but people pay for that because that's the only way for, for cure. Yeah. And so that is that segment will see innovation in, in, in many ways. You will see newer models emerge. So this whole area of diabetes uh, reversal that literally in a matter of the last, I would say six months, right? Maybe a year at most has suddenly caught fire. But today there are a half a dozen diabetes reversal sort of programs. And, you know, I personally have an investor in two of them. Uh, but if you look at it, you know, Doc, Freedom from Diabetes or Mohan, that diabetes clinic, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. But why the sudden shift, right? Again, there is obviously a shift that's being driven by your uh, uh, acceptance from the consumer. I think uh, Harsimran made a very important point also that there is a big shift in the provider side, whether it is a hospital, whether it is a doctor. You know, when I started, when I invested in Librate, we we did a market study, and each most doctors feel. that they lose about 30 to 40% of their practice to free consultation these are consultations that so normally if i come to your clinic and i i consult with you and i do a follow up the next day to tell you my lab reports or if i just have you know a question on my prescription that's normal yeah. that is accepted but if 3 weeks later i have you know a relapse or if i have another problem and i just call you it should technically be a consult and you should pay for it Correct. but the indian pop, you know user doesn't do that the indian patient is used to getting free consults from doctors and so uh, you know when we started the teleconsult business you know we were the librate was the first person that really built out teleconsult and at that time telehealth wasn't really a uh, accepted model pricing wasn't defined telehealth guidelines weren't defined and it was tough for the doctors to also do something because they were always concerned how would the regulation deal with this so i think there has been a perfect storm in a in a good way of regulation of consumer behavior change or provider behavior change which i think hasmer brought which i think is 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 critical to the next generation of uh, entrepreneurs that are emerging as entrepreneurs emerge i think more and more capital will also emerge so that is what we are seeing right now that uh, you know there was a period of time where health digital health went on the back foot the the original uh investments that happened in digital health did not deliver the promise of that time because mm-hmm. of the various issues around regulation and around consumer preference and so on but those green shoots will come back in my view is uh, what was done then some of those entrepreneurs will reemerge they will pivot they will reemerge others will take the examples of what did not work then but now regulation allows it to happen and will rebuild those businesses so i think there is going to be a lot of that on the sure. mass on the mass side i also see big opportunities emerging because fundamentally between ayushman bharat and other models around insurance and so on there is a definite understanding of how to use insurance in conjunction with innovation i think again suresh made the use the example of cms right so in the us cms with medicare medicaid has created that model where you can bring innovation in to the ecosystem on the basis of what the payers are willing to pay for and i think that is the same thing we are trying to see in india where insurance companies where the government as a payer is now looking at ways to reduce healthcare cost delivery improving access and new models will emerge because of that so so the uh... a larger topic which we are discussing here is uh, with these innovations would we also see the healthcare cost coming down will it further benefit the consumer i believe so i i you know i think uh, as you see access in particularly rural markets as well as will the cost i think on a unit basis the cost will come down on a aggregate basis i think the cost will go up because today where healthcare is needed is not being provided so today you know there is a there is a large portion of our population that should be spending on healthcare that is unable to because they don't have access to it now today if somebody has diabetes and is sitting in a village they don't have any way of reversing the diabetes yeah you put them on a digital platform they can and they'll pay for it so there is going to be potentially an increase in overall health spend but decrease on a individual basis Sure. So, Harsh, uh, Suresh, with respect to your individual ventures, what is your take on that? I mean, medical costs coming down. Oh, sorry, oh. you go first. Yeah. Sorry, you, you, Suresh, you go first. That's all. All right. So, uh, in our space, uh, I mean, uh, it's very obvious, as we just mentioned, that the CMS, or maybe for that matter, any government providers, payers, everyone, they are trying to reduce the cost, and in-center dialysis is very expensive. and for that matter even those patients who are not diagnosed what cricket health is doing uh, that sandeep invested they are doing a great job 
identifying kidney patient at very early stage. There are 10 to 15% of the patients are kidney patient, by the way, we don't know about it, but they are. And then once they end up in crash dialysis or sudden kidney failure, the expense are so high to the system. So there is one trend is happening where they're trying to detect early, predict the kidney disease progression and contain it or if possible, just to stop that, even though if they cannot reverse it. But when it comes to kidney failure per se, uh, definitely I think a uh, lot of things are happening because once we get with a device which is uh, user friendly and patient really wants to use it, uh, and then more and more home care, home care patients will uh, come out because patient really wants to get the therapy done at home. And uh, by the very nature of the home dialysis, it is about 20% cheaper. And uh, in US itself, they are spending about 40, 50 billion dollars on this. And even just if you move around 20, 30% more patients is huge, huge saving. And same thing with in India. So if you consider, I've come from a place in India, it is about 400 kilometers from Bangalore and uh, about 30, 40 kilometers from a major city. Even there is a patient in my place, he has to travel 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers to get a dialysis done. Think through, right? They cannot even right. go there. And uh, I think, first of all, the, yeah, I think cost may go. I agree with Sandeep. To some extent, those who are therapy or maybe uh, uh, healthcare is not accessible, but they may be able to access it. But for those who are already having access, but the cost will come down. So as a whole, I think society will benefit from the technology uh, if you consider, uh, I mean, in, in the total sum of it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe sounding not very too different for us. I think the way we look at costs is one, uh, you know, regulators will help in bringing the cost down. So for example, now there is uh, there is restriction on implants, for example, you know, there was there was a rampant cost on stents and stuff like that, right? So there is, so regulators will help bring that cost down a bit. Then because the access like Sandeep and, uh, you know, Suresh mentioned, as the access gets extended to more people, there will be also be, you know, mass production of some of these implants. Right now, they are being you know, produced by very limited people, concentrated in a few power centers. When it starts to progress to more democratized, uh, you know, as the you know, uh, more people start to produce it, the cost uh, starts to come down. And I think a, a, another thing which I'm sure Sandeep and Suresh will resonate with me is that a, as you start building uh, you know, uh, companies with innovative business model, a big cost is normally patient acquisition or customer acquisition, which starts to build in your bottom line. And, you know, I think uh, I think in a very, very rightful manner, India's startup ecosystem has, uh, you know, and all of us are part of it, uh, has moved to a place where entrepreneurs are far more responsible. They understand business economics. They understand p &L so much better that there's an increased focus on making business which are actually just valuable and not just aggregating customers, right? So as customer acquisition cost starts to come down because there will be more acceptance of, uh, you know, innovative models, uh, you know, tele models, all those stuff, um, you know, again, the cost starts to take a hill. And another thing is that, um, you know, as, as Suresh just was talking about, and I was, uh, you know, almost light bulb was going out in my head, uh, you know, he mentioned that he belongs to a, a village, which is, or a city, which is about 40 kilometers from a larger town. Today, we operate in about 30 cities, but we operate patients from nearly 150 cities. So if you are in Bangalore and there is a patient in, you know, let's say Hosur, or you are in Hyderabad or Bombay and there's a patient in Lonavala or Guntu, they cannot come to a Hyderabad city without, you know, with all the hassles. They, there's so much ambiguity, lack of transparency. But where there's a provider and with some of the companies which, uh, you know, Sandeep was talking about, our own company, Pristine, they can actually reach to a very, very high quality doctor digitally, talk to them, discuss their case, send their documents and actually come on the day of the surgery or a day of a treatment and actually reduce those visits. Like you said, you know, you meet a patient today, you discuss your cost, but maybe a few days line, down the line, you know, there is a complication. You have to reach out to the doctor again. Now, if you can only do that physically, then the travel takes a toll and starts to break down. But if you can do it digitally, then the number of patients who will start accessing this healthcare will start to go on. So I think that will help bringing the cost down. And I think technology that as a whole, what is happening is, uh, you know, we work with nearly 400, 500 hospitals. We, we do surgeries in uh, probably so many different places now and we get a chance very lucky to interact with some of the largest you know corporate centers and sometimes when you talk to them you understand hey why is this procedure why is this treatment costing so high a big part of that is that they have you know invested a lot in infrastructure so that's so expensive they are not able to drive a lot of utilization so cost gets passed on if they can drive more utilization because the access improves the costs come down when there is lack of competition in a certain town they get a monopoly and 
you know, we went through a slightly tough period during COVID when there were areas where patients were overcharged. But when there are more mass players, folks such as Pristine, other startups, which start to become, have same kind of very, you know, very competitive impact, suddenly the market starts to resize itself. And we have seen that impact, you know, in, uh, you know, mobility, we have seen that impact in food delivery, uh, we have seen that impact in, you know, services everywhere. When technology enables more entrepreneurs to build better solutions, when there are more customers who will get better access, there will automatically be a pricing which is going to be reorganized. So, you know, and you know, you look at airlines. When there were more players, the cost of airlines started coming down, right? So I think you will see technology having an impact um, and bring the cost down. I think another thing, uh, you know, maybe picking up from uh, Sandeep's book. Uh, another thing which we keep thinking about innovative models in healthcare of a very polite suggestion, which I be keep sharing with some of our uh, you know investor colleagues and seniors from the industry is I think on education, like you know uh, unlike a fintech or an FMCG, a lot of in investors, uh, you know senior entrepreneurs, angel investors, they come from those backgrounds, but very few people actually understand. Let's say dialysis. I don't know what Suresh would feel, but I I can almost bet that number of, uh, you know, uh, community folks who can understand dialysis the way Suresh does is almost unmatchable, right? And I think sometimes what happens is, I remember when we were raising our last round of capital uh, from Tiger Global, we had a very, very marquee investor talking to us during that period. And he said, Harsh, you know, we are sitting in the valley. We don't have a comparable model in the US. We don't have a comparable model in China. I'm not able to understand, like, you know, the complexity of what you are saying. I trust you but I have actually no real insight and that makes me, you know, uh, tough for me to take a little bit. So I think there is going to be that area where a lot of those marquee names, because, you know, a lot of those problems, you, you talk about dialysis. I think there's so many innovative models in India, you know, Suresh's team is doing so, so much amazing stuff. And so is other companies in us, but number of people who are focusing on real hard problems in some of the developing nations, India, Southeast Asia, those problems are actually not there in us and the trends are not going to follow. Right, it's not that a dark store com- concept goes viral in US and Europe, and every food delivery in India takes it up. It's easy understood. Or in fintech, where you know, you know, everybody will accumulate a lot of users and then find a way to send them, sell them loans and lending products. It's understood. It's happened in the West. It's easy to understand. But the problems which a lot of healthcare entrepreneurs are going to solve in India, it's not going to be comparable in US. There was a company in South Africa which started, or South America rather, which started doing Pristine's model. And so many investors from South Af- South America started reaching out to us. They said, hey, we don't understand what these guys are doing, but they're modeling them on Pristine. So I think there's that little education, uh, which will be part of the ecosystem and maybe not necessarily trend following from US. I think that there might be a change there. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a very important reason why trend following cannot work, right? Because the US has built its healthcare model in a very different way than it Exactly. Does. The our fee for service approach is ingrained in the model, right? We are our 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 whole payer business is still very small relative right. to the way the US works. US works, correct. I think to uh, one one sort of caution for healthcare entrepreneurs trying to build businesses in India, don't try and copy US models in India. Absolutely. I think healthcare is one area which is very very different, and you have to think of it as first principles. I think what Harsh brings up is very important. Yeah. Think of India and the needs of India, particularly in healthcare, when you're building your businesses. Exactly. And I think, uh, uh, and I think uh, you know, all the fellow entrepreneurs, like, uh, you know, something mentioned, so exciting to see uh, so many young entrepreneurs, uh, you know, trying out uh, models in variables, trying out models in dialysis, uh, primary healthcare, I think, is uh, scaling to a different level. Uh, we all know, diagno- uh, you know, diagnostics has... Uh, you know, it's so easy today to book a diagnostic test at home is actually easier than maybe ordering food. Uh, maybe food is still very easy or maybe doing some other services, right? So I think uh, I, I think there's a lot of forward looking and it's very exciting to be, uh, you know, uh, in, in this uh, ecosystem today. Yeah, I mean, so, interesting. I mean, I agree. I mean, if you consider US and any other developed country because of the payers, it's much easier to bring innovative product. I mean, you can work with uh, agencies, providers, but even if you consider dialysis India, so right now, probably less than 500,000 uh, patients are going through dialysis. Right? Right. In the US, 300 million plus people, there are close to a million patients in the next two, three years. In India, the more than a million patients are just dying, not having access. 
Yeah. Forget about innovation. Forget about bringing something different, right? So it's about reach and access there first. Before I mean, at least in our space, first I mean, before going to a cutting edge digital innovation, everything definitely it will help. I'm not denying that, but when it comes to dialysis, it's access as of now. I mean, not one, only yeah. access. You know, one other point we don't have a person on this on this uh, panel. Preventive health is actually also seeing a tremendous amount of interest from startups. I think that is also a very good sign that, you know, if we can, you know, both Harsh and Suresh are sitting at the end of the funnel in some ways, right? That mm -hmm. person will only go for a surgery or will go to dialysis in, in situations of emergency. But I think the Correct. biggest thing is uh, there is a awareness shift that's happening in the market that, hey, can you avoid getting sick? And, and how do you do that? So I think there is a lot of uh, yeah. activity happening in that sector as well. Yeah, I think, uh, and maybe in the interest of time, uh, Bitsandi pointed out on preventive health. You know, I, I actually got a chance to spend some years in the US, studied there, uh, and got a chance to learn the ecosystem. The preventive health ecosystem in some of the Western countries is so developed that you know when you go to uh, you, know, you go to a physician and you have a you have a preventive health checkup, and there is a problem or a, you know something an irregularity which is pointed out, you know you are recommended a very high quality treatment. Sometimes a treatment is, you know, goes beyond just taking a medicine. A treatment can be a procedure. It could be a dialysis. It could be, you know, correcting your lifestyle, taking medication, stuff like that. Now, that nuance in India is far from over. Here, you know, when people reach out or patients reach out to companies such as Pristine and, you know, others in healthcare, they are like on the verge of, uh, you know, that, that, that disease has become like a problem. It's like if their daily regime is is almost it's becoming too problematic for them to survive and i think in that in that notion as preventive health scales i think uh, the fundamental life cycle of the entire healthcare will move to a different tangent uh, altogether so it makes a lot of sense sure i think with this um, we'll have to wrap up this session because it's already 15 and uh, one last viewpoint from each one of you uh, sandeep uh, I want to understand from you and, of course, from Suresh and Harsh also, in terms of the conjunction we are seeing of uh, an investor and entrepreneur in healthcare, I mean, uh, do you further help them in any way? Of course, investment is one bit of it in terms of growing the model further. So, Sandeep, if you want to start with any example. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, I, I think as Harsh mentioned, part of it is being able to bring uh, insights from other markets to the India market and combine the experience that the entrepreneur is bringing uh, in that in that area with global exposure, right? So I've also lived in the US and so on and, and have worked in the healthcare consulting space with McKinsey uh, in the US. Yeah. So so it, it, there is, but ultimately, as I said, you know, a lot of it is the nuts and bolts of helping build the team, helping make the right partnerships, uh, you know, raise next round of capital and so on. So that's where, you know, we come in. So harsh. Any anecdote you want to share? I, I think I, I think I'll actually go 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 a step ahead and say I think uh, the investor community is extremely proactive. Uh, uh, while there is, like I said, there needs to be slightly more uh, level of education, but uh, you know we have such a smart community and it's thriving so much that there's a lot of work which is being done there. I think the more work which needs to be done is more on the entrepreneurial side. Uh, I, I I think a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, you know, sometimes don't go the distance to solve a problem extremely deeply from first principles. And they, you know, some of those efforts get limited to building an app, a website, and maybe few pathways. But sometimes you have to solve the problem extremely deeply. You know, somebody like a Paytm, for Paytm to survive, and today you can go to a Nukadwala and, you know, scan a code. And every other company, of course, phone pays have contributed. But somebody has to, had to go down, give them a QR code, give them a bank account where the money can be transported and maybe uh, at some, maybe initially also give them a smartphone for God's sake. Right. I, I think that is the level of uh, uh, execution, which is needed in healthcare and it will be far reaching than maybe, you know, putting together an app or a, uh, just a digital marketing acquisition channel. And I think uh, as a polite suggestion, as an expectation from our own fellow entrepreneurial community would be to go, to go the distance and solve hard problems and execute, uh, you know, deeply and first principles. I think on the, the investors are doing actually quite a lot of help. So 
rather than anything so <laughs> instead so, the project is uh, sounding quite safe i mean doesn't yeah, smoke just to add a point uh, <laughs> put it that just to add a point from my side right so we are developing a drug device combination device it's a class 3 and it is a kind of a breakthrough and if you see a dialysis device 50 years ago and the device now it looks same and even when we went to fda and asked about a, the regulatory pathway they said we haven't approved this kind of product in decades right so the challenge is is different entirely compared to digital or maybe something like in a typical scale up so we have been working on this product for last 10 years there are investors they came in 2010 and then we have to keep their motivation still up for next 5 years till we really go there and also still we have just completed the first phase of the clinical trial with very encouraging data but still we have another one or two phase for us we need and we look for investors who are really as passionate as us and also have a longer term horizon that not many investors they really want to take a risk in our kind of products compared to the other space uh, but uh, definitely that is the one thing i look into where i think they have a longer term vision and also they are ready to take risk and also bring complementary skills that is they have some network they did some kind of pma product and then they understand the market very well they have some no clinician they bring additional investment right, because of their networks and connections so um, that's why, i mean last time just to let you know i think probably sandeep can appreciate that uh, before i landed with my lead investor i had 45 meetings so uh, almost like 44th i thought okay, i can i mean it's difficult but i had to go to the 45th meeting with the same zeal and energy and everything that is as if it is my first meeting and they are going to invest in us so we need to have that perseverance when you are dealing with the deep tech and med tech just to get there and really convince and just to get to the next level so i think uh, investors are of great asset unless they come on board and they with us uh, we cannot do anything so and it's much more in the healthcare space given the the longer gestation cycle so with this uh, we would really like to conclude the session and yeah. uh, would like to thank all of you gentlemen in terms of uh, the way you have been helping the sector grow through your entrepreneurial venture and also as an investor 